are. And we are recording and we are live. So good morning. Uh, uh, welcome to this first uh, uh, interview of the morning. Um, I am Jonathan Salvan. I'm chair or chair of the OPM subcommittee. Um, I, I guess I would ask my, my uh, committee members to introduce themselves and then ask our um, our candidates uh, group to introduce themselves. So I'll start, Jonathan. I'm Kathy Shane and I'm chair of the full building committee and I'm also a town council member. And I'm Steve Schreiber. I'm vice chair of the elementary school building committee and my day job is I'm chair of architecture at UMass, which is how I know some of you. Uh, Anthony Delaney, procurement officer for the town and member of the committee. Dwayne, I think you're the, the Dwayne last. Chambell, out of school time coordinator. Yeah. Sorry, did you hear me? That was fast. Can you say it again? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Dwayne Chambell, I'm the out of school time coordinator for the uh, District of Amherst. Excellent. Good. Well, th uh, thank you, Margaret, if you want to pull up the slide deck. And yeah, we will introduce ourselves as the slide deck starts. Um, uh, give me, Margaret a chance to pull it up. Uh, I want to thank you for inviting us to, this, to, the, to be part of this process. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, we'll talk a little bit about the company. We'll introduce ourselves. We'll uh, talk some talk about some of the specifics of your firm, excuse me, of your uh, project, and then we'll uh, be able to, we'll answer some of your questions. Um, a little bit about answer. Uh, we are a national uh, program and project management firm focused on capital projects uh, solutions for our clients. Uh, we have 400 employees nationwide. Uh, we are um, fo uh, focused, we do K, K through 12 schools uh, across the country. Uh, locally, we have been in business for 22 years. We are founded as Pinking Company. Uh, we have 28 staff members in the Boston office and we have extensive experience with uh, K through 12 schools. Uh, a little bit about the makeup of our firm. Uh, nationally, three out of the firm, like three out of the uh, four and five out of the first eight legacy firms were M or WBE firms. We know, we understand uh, the importance of diversity. 50% um, of the principals of the firm are uh, uh, minority or women. And uh, locally, uh, we are founded as a WBE and 75% of our senior leadership is, uh, is women in the last office. So um, I'm going to start um, and we're going to do introductions. We're going to talk a little bit about the organization of the team as it relates to the town and the district. And we're going to talk about some of uh, the challenges that we have and then um, kind of wrap up our presentation. And then we have some slides to address some of the questions that you asked, but we'll, we'll sort of take a pause at that moment. Periodically, I'm gonna take the slides down so that we can really be people, not slides, but um, just to get started. So I'm Margaret Wood. I have, I was, uh, I was trained as an architect, but I have been working as an owner's project manager for this firm for 17 years. I have been the lead on all of our core projects um, and we've had, you know, multiple successful projects. Um, my role here is really in the feasibility and schematic design process. That means that I'm going to be your partner in the designer selection process, your partner in the development with the design team of the, the options. I will be responsible for developing the, the MSBA project budget, which is inclusive of all the hard and soft costs for the project, as well as working with you and the MSBA to determine the reimbursable, the, the reimbursement rate. Um, and um, probably most importantly for uh, given your concerns, I will be the lead on the community engagement piece. Bob? You're muted, Bob. Uh, 
Actually, why don't we, while Bob's doing that, Mary, why don't you go sure. and we'll come back to Bob, okay? Hi, I'm Mary Bolso. I've been in the business over 30 years. I will be guiding you through the construction administration, which starts the bidding process and goes through closeout. That includes, includes making sure you're safely moved into your building and coming back after 11 months to make sure everything's still functioning properly while you're still under warranty. Uh, Can I try? Right. Yep. Okay, good. Thank you. Got that fixed. Uh, my name is Bob Stevens. I'm an architect with almost 40 years of experience. Um, mainly with one Western Mass firm through 2018. And over that period of time, I functioned as a project architect or a project principal on a number of uh, uh, public school projects, including elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools, uh, both new and renovation addition projects. Um, some of those renovations included occupied uh, buildings with uh, complicated additions and, and, and complex phasing uh, requirements. So I have familiarity there. Um, I have experience uh, with both uh, the MSBA and many years prior to that, the SBAB is, is, as they used to be called. And of course the process has gotten much more complicated uh, in terms and more rigorous, but uh, on, on, on a certain level, things haven't changed. Um, a few elementary schools I recall include Grafton Elementary School um, that I was the architect for, the Stony Hill Elementary School in Wilbraham. I worked on a K through 12 facility in Sheffield, Mass and uh, also an elementary school in Palmer. And I'll be involved throughout the process to provide continuity and uh, I'll also be involved in the, the design review process. Very good. And I'm uh, Tom, Tom O'Neill, the managing, uh, uh, managing director of the Northeast region. Uh, I have, my background is construction and I have extensive experience with uh, across all markets, but it's a lot of educational Experience. I'll be helping with uh, the contracts. I'll be helping with um, public procurement, uh, logistics, and phasing for this project. Shelley, you're muted too. Uh, I'm Shelley Podorf. I'm happy to be here. I am an architect, a practicing architect, been in practice for 25 years. Um, I'm also a certified passive house consultant and lead AP. So my practice really focuses on high performance, net zero energy, regenerative design, really trying to push the boundaries on that. And that includes experience as a, the architect on five K through eight schools, two of which were LEED certified, one at the gold level, and then two buildings which were designed for living building challenge, one of which is complete and has just gotten its living building challenge pedal certification. That's a net zero building, which I can show you a little bit later. Um, in addition to that, I'm also a professor. So I teach at Middlebury College where I'm hoping to get the next generation on board and to be able to take the torch with this as well. So in that capacity, I'm a Passive House Institute US um, trainer, CPHC trainer at the university level. And if you're not familiar with Passive House, that's in essence, particularly the way FIAS runs it, it's the, trying to get to it the most affordable way to get to net zero and, and a very, um, rigorous process. So I bring that to the table and I will be doing the net zero peer review on this project. So um, Jonathan Abbe, who is on our team, um, was not able to join us at the last minute, um, but I, we have worked with Jonathan before. We included him on our team because I think one of the things that we, the thing we have seen in the past is that um, communities sometimes get focused on net zero but aren't necessarily focused on where the renewables are. I mean, a net zero building is not a zero energy building. It is really a commitment to have minimal um, energy use and then to use renewables to supply that need. So Jonathan, um, who has done, worked in a sort of wide variety of um, energy sectors, is very experienced in sort of getting the best deal for communities on solar in particular. So he's not, I think he's not gonna be able to join us this morning, but he is sort of a, I would say an ancillary part of the team, if that is something that is helpful to the town or the district. And then Pete Timothy is an also not with us, but is our long time estimating partner. Um, we use Pete on all of our schools because 100% of what Pete does is public construction estimating in Massachusetts. And that means that he always has his finger exactly on the pulse of what the costs are. And, you know, in a moment, um, we, 
very much hope that this project will not be bid in the, the current environment, which is very um, volatile, I guess is the right word to use. Um, you do not want to be bidding a project right now because um, billing costs are all over the place, but that's Pete's area of expertise. So um, just to talk a little bit, revisit um, and talk a little bit more about the overall team organization. So, you know, I think what's always really interesting to me about um, public school projects is that they're essentially a partnership between a town and a district. You know, in this case, you're actually part of a regional district as we, as we discussed earlier. And, and each of those group, you, both the town side and the, and the district side have their constituencies. Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they're independent. So you have a partnership, we have a partnership. So this is really just to illustrate that, that parallel structure. Um, Mary, myself, Bob and Mary will are this sort of partnership for the OPM team. Obviously there will be an architect in the mix here. I didn't even try to diagram that and a contractor, but Shelly, Pete and Timothy are, are kind of assists in the various areas of their expertise. Okay, so a couple moments to talk about um, six of your project goals. Um, so um, right sizing enrollment is obviously a key issue. You have, you, you had a project with 725 students that you were trying to sort of make a, a fabulous new home for. Now you're talking about 600. Um, from what I understand, that is likely to be tied up with the regional school agreement and some changes that might be made to where the sixth grade is. I actually want to have Mary talk a little bit about that. We have experience in regional school districts, but Mary is actually very involved in her own community with negotiating regional school district agreement. Mary, you want to say a couple words sure. about that? That's correct, Margaret. So I've spent the last two years, um, we, re we um, redid our regional agreement. We actually worked with the um, the two towns and redistributed the way the students are allocated to different buildings to make it more fair and equitable to the students. We have a, a small town and large town marriage and the smaller town, um, we each have our elementary schools. And what was happening was one would have 10 kids in a, 10 students in a class and the other one would have 30. So by re regionalizing the whole system instead of just the high school, now the class sizes are about 20 all the way across the board, which is much more beneficial to us. Um, that required us going to DESE to get it approved. Um, we had to have a town meeting vote. Both towns had to vote. It was uh, very successful. We did it very open, <clears throat> a lot of um, public meetings, a lot of reach out. Um, and now that has spun off into, we are collaboratively working to go for a statement of interest for a new high school for the district. Great. So um, a, a second thing that's, I think very, very high on your goals is creating a warm child-centered building. Um, you know, it's obvious there's a lot of um, anxiety provoked by the notion of taking two, you know, quite small school communities and putting them together. And, and I don't want to disguise that this is fundamentally the job of the architect. Um, you know, we will assist with this, but I think getting, there's, to me, there's two pieces. One is getting the right design partner and I think the second is really looking at precedents that people can relate to so that the community sees what this could be, um, I think is, is you know, really gonna be central to people kind of not just voting for the project, but really embracing it, um, which you know, toggles into this issue of um, ensuring public support. So, you know, failed vote, you know, what a miserable situation after all the investment. But I think a couple of things um, as I've sort of been watching this from a distance that keep bubbling up that are really likely to be at the core of what you say about this project that seem, people seem to be widely understood is one, that the need for an improved learning environment to get rid of the open plan buildings is really the nugget that the 
a project that you're proposing, which is not necessarily, but likely to be a sort of combined facility, brings with it a, a lot of, it's a very fiscally responsible uh, proposal, both in terms of the first cost, as well as the operational cost, not just the building operational cost, but the administrative cost. So I think that fiscal responsibility is something with, which I do think people understand, but is should be at the heart of this discussion. And I also think that the proposal that you're talking about has a lot of legs in terms of equity, diversity, and inclusion. So um, I think all of those, are, you because of the conversations you've had, you've kind of set the table for those being at the heart of that process. Bob, you want to talk a little bit about the, and actually Shelly to chime in too about the high sure. performance building sure. piece. Yep. Well, obviously, we know you, you, your goal is to deliver a net zero project, and uh, Margaret has introduced two professionals that will be providing the expertise to, to achieve that. Um, I think achieving it will require a lot of follow through. Um, there'll be ideas thrown out at the schematic level that need to be properly budgeted for, but it'll take focus to ensure that those goals established at the schematic design phase are, are later properly uh, implemented as, as feasible. And again, we certainly appreciate the help that Shelley will be, uh, be providing along the way. I should also point out that even though net zero far surpasses uh, lead requirements, the MSBA will still be looking for either lead certification or mass chip certification in order for the town to uh, get two additional reimbursement points, which is important. Mary, how about um, chiming in on the occupied site? Sure. So um, it's not unusual to have occupied sites when we're building schools. I've done this multiple times. My biggest thing is the safety. Um, putting together a um, complete logistics plan with the contractor and the architect and the owner before the shovels hit the ground, laying out where the bus is going to line up, where's pickup, drop off, parent pickup, parent drop off, because we all know not everybody takes the bus anymore. Um, and then I always invite the public safety team to come and review the site how we're gonna lay it out, how we're gonna set it up. Because if there is an emergency, they need to know that the doors have changed or the entrance has changed and how is the flow gonna to move to keep everybody on the same page and everybody safe. And that's, that's typically what I do is, uh, you know, again, back to communication, making sure everybody knows where. Because in these days, it's not just the parents, it's the grandparents, it's everybody that's coming to that site. There are a lot of people that you have to watch out for. Uh, back to you for budget yep. and schedule. Sure, yeah. Um, I think we can all agree on the importance of, of, uh, of meeting budget and schedule. And uh, part of our focus is to help establish and maintain the budget and execute uh, the project on time. Um, but in my opinion, I think each each of the, these works hands in hand in terms of uh, controlling uh, uh, costs. Um, while construction schedules are often dictated by the occupancy of the school, um, mm -hmm. you need to also really focus on the schedule for the design process and making sure there's adequate time during the design process to properly estimate and to allow the town to make the proper decisions associated with costs. Um, I've been involved in fast track projects where um, foundations are going in before uh, the budget is really nailed down and it, 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 it uh, leads to problems. And when the budget is established, it should be realistic and it should incorporate um, a reasonable contingency for unforeseen uh, things that arise during, during the process. I think we're just about at our 15 minutes. So I, I'm just going to wrap up and say, kind of repeat some things that hopefully you already see about our team. We, we are bringing a very experienced team to this. We are, we are seniors in terms of our experience. And you know, we think that that's beneficial to this project. We're really good at making public presentations. We're going to talk about that some more during the Q&A period. We've done, actually all of us have done um, logistically challenging projects on sites that are occupied by kids. Um, we have a team that is net zero, cap can make a net zero capable building, but it can also help you make sure that you can bring the renewables to the project. We have a very diverse team. I think it's hard to imagine that we are not the most diverse team that you're going to see today. And, you know, again, as I said in my intro, we're really committed to public schools. We really understand that they're the commons of public education. And that's why we all do this work. 
So that's our formal, that ends our formal presentation. We do have some slides to address your questions, however you wanna answer that, um, manage that. Um, I think we can, uh, there we go. Oh, I shouldn't speak for the chair here. Should we? <laughs> Sorry, no, I was <laughs> muted. <laughs> Thank you very much. That, that was a, a great presentation. Um, it, we'll start our questions. I know Anthony's got the first one, so I will hand it off to Anthony to ask the first question. Okay. Uh, can you describe one particularly challenging elementary school project for which you served as OPM and maybe some of the lessons learned there? Sure. Um, so we've actually worked um, as individuals and together on a wide variety of elementary schools. Um, I won't go into the details here, but this is kind of a sampling of them. Um, and we spent a fair amount of time um, talking about whether any of them were a good fit with this question um, in terms of challenges. And actually, to be honest, most of these elementary schools had did not have the challenges that you have. Uh, we think that the key challenge that you have is actually the occupied site. So with apologies for not answering the question exactly as you asked it, I wanna talk a little bit about our Clark Avenue Middle School project. So not an elementary school, but um, it was a project you can sort of see here in these slides where there was an existing building um, it's in an urban environment, so, you know, not Amherst, but it had a limited footprint and the building was in horrible shape. Um, this part of the building was actually not occupied because of the condition. And what we did in close partnership with the design team and with the construction manager is we developed a phasing plan, which knocked down this part of the building first, so that this, you can see in the second slide, there was the, the, the operational part of the building stayed intact. Then we built the new taller classroom building on the site. Um, the distance, and you can kind of see it here, between the new building construction and the operational building was about like 10, 15 feet max. Um, and um, I will tell you, one of the challenges was not distracting the kids who were in those classrooms <laughs> with the construction that was happening right outside their window, but oops, hang on a second. So we, we finished that, and then we took down the next piece of the building um, that wasn't needed, then the whole building, then we built the new gym and administrative um, the new public entrance and the and the gym and facility. So, um, I mean, I think this is, you know, to me, this is the nugget. Like you, you want to build a building on an occupied site and how you do that and having people who have experience with this with, you know, I think you're going to have to create a new entrance for construction vehicles. You're going to need to move your playground. You're going to need to do all of these pieces. The, you have the advantage that you've already looked at some of these in the previous project. So it's not entirely like inventing the wheel, but having a team that has this experience and has done this before, I think is really important. Um, over on the side here is a picture of an elementary school that we did as phase construction. And you can see there were lots of different phases. The building was kept occupied the, same, the whole time, um, you know, moving kids around within the school. But I don't really think you're talking about renovating a building here. Oh, well, I suspect it's one of the options we will, we will look at as part of the study process, but. Agreed. Margaret, if I could just add one comment, one of the important things that I've learned over the years with these occupied renovations or building on the same site next to an adjacent school is um, working with the administration for testing. When the MCAS come up, construction stops for that week. Yeah. And you're obviously maximizing in both cases here you're maximizing the summers, you're planning the schedule around the big chunk that you can bite off and do that is the most dangerous or problematic, whether it's abatement, demolition, both of these projects 
use the summers and school vacations as very intensive work periods and had a fair amount of weekend construction um, and to sort of grease the wheels and make sure that things that were like, you know, utility, um, move, moving utilities over from one location to another, you know, was not disrupting the operations of the school. I don't want to cut you off, but I just want to make sure before we ask the next question that, that you feel like you've had the opportunity to answer. Yeah, that's, that's, the, okay. that's the nugget. Um, I, I am going to do the next question, and which is describe your experience with net zero energy capable schools or other net zero projects. Um, and please also discuss the cost consideration and how these are managed. So I'm gonna turn this over to Shelly. I will tell you that um, we are working on a couple of current projects, but they're not finished. So Shelly's really, she's our guru here. So Shelly. Thank you. So um, we have a couple slides here and I just wanna walk through basically what the process is and I'll get it answering your questions as this goes. But typical net zero design process is here at the top, these four steps. First, you optimize the building shape and orientation, then the building envelope, then the systems, and only after you've done all those things do you add the renewable system. So that's the general process. It's very, you know, it's simple to understand. Uh, what gets complicated is, well, figuring out what's the most affordable way to get there, where, because there are multiple options, right? So that's part two here, getting to that affordable option. In this particular process, um, the first thing, so to get the building shape and orientation right, you would do a shoebox energy model. I would recommend that that be done when you're looking at the three different options, whether it's renovation, part renovation, or new construction. And the reason that I say that is because I think after you've chosen your preferred uh, building, it's going to be difficult to change that too much after the fact. So I think that sort of work needs to be done as you're considering those three options. And that will also give you some energy feedback and cost estimating on those as well. So once you get to the preferred option, um, here's where really you get into it. You, you've got your preferred option and you want to... Um, model three different levels of performance. So a code-based building, a high performance building at the other end, and then something in the middle. It's easy to say that, but there needs to be some expertise in determining what, how to meet those three levels of performance because there's options within all of those. So that's where I'll be helping out and hopefully we will have selected a design team that has experience as well and, and we can have a good conversation about dialing and what actually to model. So then from there, I mean, you're modeling you're modeling those options and cost estimating those options. And really, honestly, in this case, because it's already been determined that you're going to be net zero, the cheapest first cost wins. Operational cost is, is out of the picture because in all three cases, it's going to be net zero. So you really are looking for what's the cheapest mix between um, building envelope systems and your renewable system. And it changes daily. You know, it's changing because the price of solar panels are changing. Um, obviously, construction costs are, are crazy right now. So you won't know. We, we simply won't know which of those three options is going to be the cheapest until we're at the moment of modeling them and then cost estimating them. But that's the, the general way to go about it. Um, there is one caveat here that it came up on a previous slide that I do want to mention, um, which is that we haven't, when you get to net zero energy, that's operational energy. So we haven't talked about embodied energy. And what we're finding in the field more and more is that that embodied energy is actually really high when we're looking at timeframes within which we need to make the shifts that we need to make. So if the goal of being net zero, which I presume it is, is to provide a viable future for us, um, we're kind of shifting, well, not just kind of, but we've found that we're, we can oftentimes just be shifting carbon and operational energy into carbon and to the upfront costs. And that comes in the form of the structure and mostly insulation, out of insulation. The good news is that we have, uh, we're very good at modeling embodied energy now. The design team should be able to do it within Revit and do that analysis alongside of the energy modeling. There are insulations out there that are, will store carbon rather than have a high, very, very high carbon footprint. 
So I think, you know, the only caveat to this lowest cost wins is also um, to at least consider what the embodied carbon is in those various options. So um, in the next slide, Margaret, I'll continue with, with this. So my role in all of this is, first of all, to assist in, you know, selecting a design team that has these expertise that I'm talking about. That will make the process easier and then I can, I will be there to help guide that along as well as just provide peer review. Um, I want to spend a little time on the second one, which is a system envisioning the educational opportunities of net zero buildings. And I already talked about the carbon reduction goals, but I want to bring attention to this photo on the right. This is the Living Building Challenge Studio at the Monarch School. This campus actually is a three fairly large um, uh, educational buildings within itself. It's a, it's a private school for kids with neurological differences. All the entire campus is lead gold and every all three build the other main three academic buildings are lead gold. They wanted to push the border more and provide this classroom studio that would go for living building challenge. So this process actually started with a very intense community engagement, stakeholder engagement, integrative design in the way that Margaret's talking about which went all the way through conceptual design. And it's designed to be a lab for the students. So the other thing that I just want to point out is that if the reason we're we are pursuing net zero is to provide a viable future, particularly for our kids, we also have to understand that our kids are going to have to be the stewards of that future. They're going to have to be a lot smarter than we are, to be honest. And it's not too soon to start start that process in elementary school. And there's plenty of examples of this um, through Living Building Challenge projects and, and others where the building itself is, is a project-based learning tool. In this particular case, this building is designed for both passive cooling as well as active conditioning. And the active system is a geothermal system with a, a ventilation displacement system. And then it's got a five kilowatt uh, array on the roof. The students are responsible for monitoring that system. They're responsible for knowing when it should be in active mode versus when it should be in passive mode. Um, they can track like how is the array performing relative to different weather conditions. There's even a meter where the geothermal lines come into the building that tells them what the temperature of the water is when it's going down into the ground and what it is when it comes back. So there's there's all sorts of opportunities built into this building so that the students can use it as a project. And I'm pointing this out because that really, um, if that we don't pursue that on this project, it would be a missed opportunity. And that has to start at the community engagement process. So um, that's something I'll be assisting with. Then from there, it's really getting into the nuts and bolts. So figuring out what those three options are that we'll be modeling and cost estimating and then peer review during the construction documents. I've often served in the role of redlining other architects, uh, wall sections, section details, and et cetera, to make sure that the building is going to perform as, as um, intended. And then also help with making sure that the commissioning agent is considering um, and looking and checking everything that needs to be checked to make sure that this performs at net zero. Um, I just want to add, um because we I always feel very constrained by the MSBA um, format, the 20 page limit on our proposal. We didn't have a chance to talk very much about building commissioning, but it's so important. I mean, it, the net zero process also depends on quality commissioning. Um, in this case, and, and some of you probably already know, but I'll repeat that the MSBA, one of the real perks, if you will, of the MSBA process. Often doesn't feel like they give you anything. They give you a commissioning agent. It is an assigned commissioning agent. You don't get to pick them. But um, we were involved actually um, in developing the commissioning program as consultants to the MSBA. And we're very familiar with the consultants they use. They're, they're very good. They don't get assigned until after you've signed your funding agreement. So, you know, part of what's going on here is um, kind of thinking, bringing the commissioning agent thinking about how you design the envelope into this process by having um, Shelly on the team. And, and of course, whoever the design team brings. Um, 
and then, you know, it's, it's just a very, as we've discussed, a very integrated design process after that. So that's it for the, our response to that question. And I have to admit, I have forgotten which was, which of us is, is asking question number three, but yeah. I'm sure that person will chime um, in. Yeah, I'm number three. Thank you. So this is a two part question. What techniques or activities have you used to engage the broader community? And what strategies have you used to help communities reach the final approval? And while describing, can you use specific examples of any challenges, successes, or failures? Yes. So I'm going to talk about this. I probably talked too much already, but this is my zone. So um, with the assistance of my great team members, um, I, I want to say, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, in doing the listening sessions that you've already conducted, you, you've done some great work. I mean, these sort of key issues that have evolved is the things that what, what people can agree upon, which is the we need a better learning environment for staff, students, and families. We want a fiscally responsible approach. A green school is something that's sort of brought new to the project to this project since the last project, but it is something that it seems like everybody can get together around. And also this ability of the project to sort of unify the town and address special ed, diversity and inclusion. Th those are gonna be the foundational issues. Um, some of the concerns that you've heard and you know, I would expect to hear in this situation are, you know, what does it mean if, if you do consolidate schools? Will people lose their jobs? Will there be a budget for a single school that's then getting um, sort of, you know, <laughs> uh, scoured away through the, the budget process? How can a 600 student school feel small? What happens if the enrollment goes up? Because guess what, it does a lot. You know, communities build these schools and all of a sudden people who were in other, who were going out of district or to a charter school are like coming back. Um, what will transportation look like? And will people leave the district if the school communities are joined together? I mean, I will tell you that's the least of my concerns because I think it's more likely that you're gonna see an enrollment increase. But you've heard that, and I, I see that in the, in the conversations you've had as a concern. So, you know, again, the, the first slide is about, you know, what people can agree about. And the second slide is about what you need to know are anxiety points. So how do you, well, what are the strategies, Dwayne, to your question? So, I mean, the, the one that has to be at the top of the list is about being inclusive, right? Um, you need to make sure that all the colors and languages of the school community are represented and addressed. Um, we didn't officially put her on the team, but um, we've worked with um, a woman named Josiane um, Hernandez, who has a firm called Archipelago Strategies. Um, I worked with her on the Build um, BPS Master Plan project. We've also done projects now in Chelsea in Holyoke, in Lawrence. I mean, we have worked very closely with communities. If, if they had the expertise in the community, we used it. If the, arc, if the design team had the expertise, we used it. If we needed additional expertise and language skills, we brought them in. So you have to do that. That's absolutely critical. Um, in terms of successful and, uh, tech activities um, and techniques, having a brand, you know, yes on two, <laughs> yellow lawn signs, yellow, you know, wristbands, you know, something that people can like have a sticker, have a button. Like I, I think being able to find your supporters and help them develop a brand so that people start to recognize this. I mean, you probably did this in your previous project, but I will tell you, it's one of the most successful techniques that we've ever seen um, used or helped to develop. Um, I think establishing a core group of community supporters, I mean, you'll have a big team, but that team basically has to convey a core narrative and message out to supporters who then are spreading the message further. Who are those people? How can you help them answer questions? Um, Facebook, Mary, maybe you want to talk about 
how Facebook's been used in your community? Yeah, we did a lot of, um, especially with the pandemic and not being able to have large community meetings, we've done a lot of Facebook Lives where the residents um, and the stakeholders can type questions into the chat and the moderator receives the questions and asks the panels, the panelists the questions. Um, and then we were able to save that, load it to our local website, load it to our local cable channel um, to hit all the masses. Not everybody is on Facebook, um, but it's been very successful. Um, strategies to reach final approval. approval. It's, it's kind of a short message. You wanna be very concrete. You wanted to have a tax calculator. We can help you develop a tax calculator, which is where you can go to a certain location on the town's website or the district's website, put in your um, your housing assessment, your how your home assessment, and it'll tell you you know what your cost is going to be, um, what not to do. Um, don't change the message late in the game. Um, I've worked in a community where this happened, where they kind of got anxious that the late in the game and said like, oh, well, we found some more money and it was just a disaster. I mean, you just can't, you have to like figure out what your narrative is early and stick with it. Um, we do have what we call a community engagement toolbox, which is really built around the develop, these develop and inform pieces, you know, figuring out what the most important information is and then figuring out how you're gonna do the informing. So um, this is a bit of a recapitulation of what you've heard before, but you know, for sure we know, um, and you know, we mentioned in our um, proposal that people in Amherst really like to discuss. <laughs> the H is the only thing that is silent. And um, honestly, we love that. We'd much rather have people engaged than not engaged. <laughs> so we do not shy away from that. So, um, Dwayne, I hope that answers your question. And Margaret, I'll, I'll just add uh, a couple of specific examples. And I think, as Margaret said, this is her zone. And uh, it worked not just in elementary education uh, projects, but also in our housing projects and, and a lot of our other projects. Uh, she's absolutely engaged. Uh, but I'll give a couple of specific examples. Uh, in Norton, the Norton High School project uh, was up against, uh, they were they required to renovate their building. Uh, they chose to renovate in addition. They needed a debt exclusion. It was the first, it would have been, it will have going to be the first debt exclusion they had ever uh, done as a town. They were incredibly nervous about it. Margaret met with every imaginable group possible, uh, Rotary clubs, school with clubs, with, the, with the architects, by the way, it's, it's a team effort. It's a team effort, yes. And, uh, and they, they both passed 72% favorable. So it was something that they were nervous about, but they prepared for, and we were very much engaged. And then I'll give you a very recent example with the city of Lawrence. Uh, the city of Lawrence has a, 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 a two projects uh, in process right now. Uh, one's extremely uh, difficult, and that's the one we're working on. And the other one is uh, is um, a little, little bit more straightforward of a school project. Um, we the project got to the point where it passed the uh, finance committee vote, but then was struggling to uh, to pass the uh, the city council. They had tabled the vote. Uh, at that point in time, our, our project director was just all hands on deck, talking to everybody in the in the city who had supported the project. Uh, compounding the pro program is, as a lot of you know, Mayor Rivera left uh, to, to go uh, run mass development. So he, uh, the, he, he had been guiding the project all the way through. So we just, we reached out, we engaged everybody who was a stakeholder. Um, uh, everybody was interested in this project. Everybody wanted this project to happen and they had passed its vote last Tuesday. So specific examples. I could add a little bit too, um, just building on, on uh, the frequently asked questions uh, suggestion there. Uh, you have to try to envision all the all the uh, tough questions you're going to get, like, uh, you know, what happens if the project is over budget, and uh, how do we know this design solution meets your educational needs? And, um, how do we know this is the best option? And what other options have been explored? You need to be prepared to really defend the solution of the preferred solution that you're trying to sell. Um, seems kind of basic, but I've just experienced lots of questions along those lines. So that's I, get, it. I get the next question, which is, have you or your firm ever been terminated from a project 
or had one ending without proceeding? If yes, discuss any lessons or insights gained from this experience. So I am going to talk about our project in Holyoke because it has some similar, obvious similarities to you. So this was um, a project that really started with an equity discussion in Holyoke. They really have kind of no middle school space that's suitable at all, um, but they have 1,100 middle school kids. So the, the building committee uh, with the um, participation of the receiver and the mayor at the time, I think you probably all know Alex is left now, um, were really committed to solving the problem for all 1,100 kids. That was a big thing to bite off um, for a community that has you know, very sort of um, low income level. So what was proposed was two more or less identical. They were kind of kid of parts schools on two different sites. Um, it did not pass, um, mostly because of money. Um, but I think it's, it's very like what's going on in Amherst. It was the beginning of the discussion, not the end of the discussion. They are back in the pipeline now for a single building, um, one of the two buildings with the hopes that it eventually some years in the future, they will be able to build the second building because people liked the buildings. They agreed with the notion of the middle school. I mean, there were, you know, like Amherst, um, there are, it was the beginning of discussion. The, the conversation evolves. I, I do not believe if you look at the history of failed votes that there are any situations where the failed vote was the end of the conversation. It was, the, it was a step in the process. And I think that you are in that place too. And I think it's, you know, point being, you don't wanna repudiate what's happened before. You sort of wanna say, it's a continuous conversation. Great. Kathy, I think you have our last one. I'm the last one. Um, and, and you've already been talking a little bit about this, but would you describe your team style in managing the school building project on how do you view your roles in relationship to designers, architects, owners, and other partners? So I'm going to turn this over to Bob and Mary, who will be doing the most of the managing of the partners. But I will say, you know, I think there's um, what we want to just say to begin with is there's the sort of how the MSBA structures it, which is great. And then there's the reality of all the different perspectives. So Bob and Mary, why don't you take this one on? Sure. I think our style focuses on uh, understanding roles and getting the best performance out of uh, everyone on the team. And I think that requires uh, strong, building strong relationships and, uh, and working cooperatively with all the team participants to achieve the owner's goals. Um, and considering the integrated design approach where you have all your players on board early in, in the process, you have an opportunity to leverage everybody's talents and um, including possibly the construction manager if CM at risk is the approach that you take. So you have everybody there in the room and it just, it really relies on cooperation between all the, uh, all the participants. And uh, disharmony amongst the particip participants does not, does not help the cause. So you have a number of possible barriers or encounters or, 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 or uh, problems that, that may pop up. All jobs have a certain percentages of, of those. So um, working cooperatively is, is really important. And uh, I think it's our job to manage, but it's not our job to, to make other, or intentionally make other people look bad. I think, again, the spirit of cooperation is, is, uh, is our goal. So I'll add to that. Yeah, I agree. It, it is a team effort. We all do have to work cooperatively. One of the things that I like to do when I first start a project is um, construction 101, basically orientate the client, meet with the building committee and explain the roles, put together an Excel chart with has, that outlines the task of who's responsible for what. What does the OPM do? What does the architect do? What is the owner responsible for? What is the contractor responsible for? To eliminate duplication of tasks and make sure that nothing falls through the cracks. For example, National Grid, they're always the hardest one to get to site, takes a long time. 
you got to go through the process. You know, you know, the, the architect's consultant fills out the load sheet. The owner needs to sign any easements. It's, it's a, there's multiple people that need to know where they, where their um, job responsibility is. Even though you're a volunteer committee, we all have a, a role that we play. So I, I, I find using that chart is extremely helpful to everybody. And it's in chronological order, helps us get through, um, you know, our, our roles to define that, yeah, the architect designs the building, but the OPM works with them to make sure that the, it's constructible. And then the CM at risk looks at it from their standpoint. Um, and maybe some value engineering as a, as a group. We, we work together as a team, constant communication, constantly working together. So that's, that's the way I approach it. And I'd like to add in here as well, like is, is when I do peer review for our architects, whether I was hired by the architect or by the owner, um, having, being an architect myself and knowing how complex that process is, uh, it's easy to, you know, become critical. Oh, why didn't you figure, why didn't you do this? Why did you miss that? Or whatever the case may be. And having, you know, been on the other side of that uh, for most of my career and still um, the way I approach it is I, when I, in that peer review role, I'm part of their team. That's the way I think about it. I'm on their team as if I were working for them, not as some outsider who is there to pinpoint everything that you know they might have missed because it's so complex and there's so many people involved um, that I just think the, when you have this outside review, it just helps. And it's true, it doesn't matter how experienced the architect is or how experienced the team is, having that peer review helps in every, every single instance if it's there. So that's, that's the way that I approach it. Yeah, she Shelly's correct. I have had an experience where early on, one professional from a building committee um, was keeping score of the architect. Um, we're gonna have change orders. You know, nobody has a crystal ball. So it got to the point where I took that gentleman and the architect over to Dunkin' Donuts for coffee and uh, discussed the issue and, <laughs> and that went away. <laughs> Well done, Mary. <laughs> so that wraps it for that question. Can I, I just want to ask one follow up. You're, um, many of you are based in Boston, and I think Shelley said Vermont. So some of what you've described is hands on, like you're physically there. Um, it's so in the way your, your time is allocated, will you be able to be here in Amherst when you need to be? For those, for those roles you've just described. Yeah. So we should talk a little bit about where we're all from. So I, I, am, in, I am from Boston, although my husband and I have a home in the Hilltowns. So um, we're out there a lot. But Bob is from Westfield. Mary is from Worcester. Shelly is the furthest away. <laughs> and she is Emily, definitely I don't know. Emily, I don't know. I'm, <laughs> so I'm, I'm in Sudbury, uh, near 20 minutes south of Middlebury. So I don't get, I, I also am from Texas. So my Texas standards, I'm not that far away. <laughs> yeah. um, I, um, myself, I'm always on site, on the road. Um, you know, I always joke, everything's within an hour, whether it is or not. And, you know, I spent, after having four children, I drove back and forth to UMS Amherst to get my degree. So it's not that far. And so I actually, I just want to say, although my daughter is not thrilled about it. Our youngest daughter just accepted UMass Amherst this weekend. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna expect to be fearing a lot of dirty laundry back and forth from Amherst to Boston, no matter what, so. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Great, well that uh, I believe concludes our list of questions. Um, any parting thoughts? No, just want to say uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we look forward to it. Uh, we, um, we, we enjoyed the process. Uh, this is, a, it's, you're, you're, an, you're an informed uh, committee, which is, uh, is always is good for us because I think we can, um, we're, not, we're not informing about the MSBA process. We're not informing about the, this process. You understand it. So we can go, get into the details like we did in, in the enjoyable process. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony, uh, just a point of um, 
uh, process? Do I have, since this is a public meeting, do I have to officially close it uh, as well? Uh um, yeah, I think, I think we should adjourn. Um, this is a special meeting, so there's no public comment at a special meeting. I cleared that with the, with the clerk. So, uh, and then we'll see each other at 10. Yep. And Anthony, can I just ask, will we have a copy of these slides we've just seen? Oh, good question. That is a good question. Yes. Yeah, if you could email those to me. I will, I'm going to send you the PDF as soon as we sign off. Okay. Yeah. Thank you and very much. Yeah, and the recording of this meeting will be uploaded to the town's YouTube channel in time. Whenever, whenever IT gets around to that. Terrific. Because I is it there's possible for you to. Uh, <laughs> we could talk about that later. Okay. Okay. So I, I will uh, form, formally adjourn uh, this meeting. Thank you very much. All right. And good luck, Bye, everyone. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you.